There is a, a possibility, it's not even a possibility, it's almost a certainty, that your risk analysis is flawed in one or more ways, right? And one of the ways in which it can be flawed is that it doesn't include a risk item that probably ought to be there, or that it includes a risk item, but it, it significantly underestimates the level of risk, and as a result, it's not going to get tested much, if at all. So what I'm talking about here are holes in your test coverage, right? Now, it's hard to discover holes in your test coverage. Well, actually, it's easy. You just ship the product without having tested things. You wait till the customers scream, right? <laughs> but that's not usually a good way of dealing with that particular potential problem. A better way of dealing with that is to have some sort of counterbalancing strategy as part of your, your overall test strategy that will allow you to, with a fairly minimal amount of effort, check to see if you've missed anything, okay? And the, the way to do this is to use some sort of reactive test technique that is directed at the areas for which there's not a lot of formal testing. Now, reactive test techniques, examples are exploratory testing, Bach, Kaner, Bolton, exploratory testing. You've got the uh, Whitaker's series of books, How to Break Software, that, just, that include all of the different attacks, software attacks. That, that's a, a form of reactive testing. Basically, any kind of testing where, rather than the tests being pre-scripted to a great level of detail, the tests are, if anything's written down, it's simply general guidelines about, here's some place to go look at, right? Spend some time looking at this. Spend some time looking at that, right? That it tends to be a very effective and efficient way to find bugs in an area if bugs are present there. Okay? It's not very good at confidence building because your traceability is basically zero. And it's worthless for bug prevention because there isn't any test analysis or design beforehand so you can't find problems until you actually get the system because what makes a reactive test strategy reactive is that you're reacting to the system as it's actually presented to you as opposed to trying to prepare beforehand. Okay? But that said, very useful in conjunction with a more analytical, upfront, risk-based testing approach because the, the strengths and weaknesses of those two strategies are complementary. Okay? Analytical risk-based testing is very good at confidence building. It's very good at producing coverage information that can be used to determine the residual level of risk. And so it, it fills in for that weakness in the reactive test, te test techniques. The reactive test techniques are very good at finding bugs, particularly bugs that would be easily missed by a more analytical technique. Right? So by mixing those together, you get a good balanced strategy. Now, to the extent that your reactive techniques do uncover risks that you missed before, those of course need to be driven into your risk analysis. And that might change your overall risk analysis sufficiently enough that you actually do decide to triage existing tests that you had written. All right? And again, the way to think about this is don't throw good money after bad. Right? Just because you wrote the test doesn't necessarily justify running it if you've now discovered there's something more important for you to do. Right? The, the test is a means to an end. It's not an end itself. Is there any advantage to doing this? We, we do something called, we call it ad hoc. Mm -hmm. and we Same tend thing. We do it towards the end of the testing cycle. Mm. We kind of do it, and this is, we kind of just give the tester a little bit of guidance in terms of, mm -hmm. you know, go look at this cool. area, mm -hmm. go look at that area. Is it better to, to focus in on what you know are the higher risk areas, or 
would it give you more benefit to focus on the lower risk areas to maybe identify things that you may not have suspected? So a couple things there. I would, I would tend to integrate it throughout the entire test execution period rather than just waiting at the end because if I discover that my risk analysis was way off at the end, <laughs> uh-oh. <laughs> yeah, you know, you're, you're out of good options at that point, right? Usually the direction that I give the testers is go and test some areas that you think we might be under testing for whatever reason, okay? Because it's experience-based testing. So what you're relying on is the experience of the tester. So if the tester's got a little voice in the back of her head that's saying, you know, I don't think we're testing enough here, then that's exactly what you want her to listen to, right? Okay, if you think there's a bunch of bugs under that rock, go turn the rock over, right? And you're making a fairly minimal investment in it unless there are indeed a bunch of bugs under that rock, in which case you're going to adjust your risk assessment. And again, that might result in triage of tests and all those sort of things. But better earlier in the test execution period than later to have that happen.